you for being with us. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so thankful to be with you again. It's so funny. I was out there. There was no snow, but it was just as hard to find a parking place today as it was <laughs> that day we had all the snow. Uh, but thank God he, he provided somewhere for us to park. Uh, Again, it's always a pleasure to be before you because I recognize that uh, despite my handsome looks, I'm undeserving of being in this pulpit uh, to preach. Uh, it is only by God's grace and his compassion and love towards me that I'm able to be able to do such a, such a wonderful thing as preach his word. Uh, today is a special day. Not that no other day is a special day, but today is special because it's today we are celebrating Mother's Day. Uh, we are celebrating the wonderful women in our lives, and I just want to give an example of what makes mothers so unique uh, by telling a bad story about a father. Uh, so a few weeks ago, I was at the skate park with my kids, and uh, my youngest was having a hard time getting down the double hill. Uh, and that's where basically you go down one small hill, you go about 15 yards, and then you go down a steeper hill. And he could go down the steeper hill by himself if he never went down the short hill. But when he tried to do them together, he would always just jump off when it got to that big hill. And so me being the dad who I thought I was, I said, you know what? I'm going to teach my son to be brave, how you conquer your fears and just go for it. I haven't skateboarded since I was 11 and I'm 42 years old, but I'm going to go for it. So I went up there and I got ready to go for it. And this wonderful mother who was there with her child said to me, sir, are you sure you want to do this? I said, hey, listen, mom, you know how it is. It's the kids. He's scared. I got to do it, you know, touch them about braveness and just being able to push through your fears. And she was like, dad, I'm just a little more worried about you than I am him. And I was like, I got this. Went through the first slide very well. Went down the hill. I was coasting. I was like, see, son, this is how you do it. Got a little cocky, I'll be honest. And then as I started to go down the second hill, I attempted to do something that was very not normal to me, which was I started to lean back and like skid on the back of the skateboard like I was doing it on purpose, but it was not. And I swiftly fell to my bottom. It seemed like it took about 45 seconds to do it because it's like everything's in slow motion when it happens. But uh, quickly, I fell straight on concrete outside concrete into a seated position and then brace myself with my arm which is why I have this and I say all that to say is mothers are a precious gift because that mother warned me <laughs> she tried to warn me and you know what even if a mother saw her child going through such a thing a mother would never actually get on the skateboard a mother would have asked one of the other young men who were there will you go show my son how to do this that is why you guys are the special gifts you are. You guys take care of us fathers when we make foolish mistakes. You take care of the kids. Uh, and we are thankful <laughs> for you today. Uh, but also, I recognize that as we celebrate Mother's Day, uh, we're appreciative of all of you. But Mother's Day can be a, a mixed bag because uh, not all of us had great experiences with our mothers. Not all of us knew our mothers. But even in light of that, I want to say we are thankful that you're here. And I want to give uh, thanks to mothers who have been stepmoms foster moms, fill-in moms, uh, you know, aunties who aren't really moms but serve as moms. Uh, but thanks to all, and we know that we're praying for you, even if this is a hard day uh, for you, and that God's grace will be with you. And that even if your mother was not who she needed to be for you, God is all that you need. He can actually fulfill all of those roles. And so uh, I'm thankful. So I'd like to real quickly pray for this word as well as pray for the mamas here. Will you all bow your heads with me? Dear Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you for your faithfulness and your kindness towards us. We thank you for the opportunity uh, to give thanks for the wonderful women in our lives. Thank you for the mothers who have faithfully served not only their children but their husbands. Thank you for the mothers who have sacrificed so much, and oftentimes, in the earthly, it seems as if they receive so little. But Lord, you are faithful. You see their good works. You see their good deeds. You see, and Lord God, you will not let them go unrewarded. So I pray, Lord God, for those who are here, that you will comfort them, give them strength, give them peace of mind. I pray for those who have broken relationships with their mothers that you would move in a mighty way to begin to heal. I pray for those who have lost their mother and they're grieving that they would be comforted in this time. And I pray for mothers who recognize that they have maybe not done what they needed to do with their kids, that you would also comfort them and give them the boldness to pursue their children in love and kindness. Lord, we ask before we preach this word that you would empower me, the preacher, 
knowing that it's only through your power and your strength that this word goes forth. And only when you move through your Holy Spirit that this word even takes root and is even able to be blossom into a great seed and great fruit for those who hear it. So, Lord God, we submit this to you, give you glory, give you praise, and pray that we all be transformed by the renewing of the, our minds as we hear this word today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're in the book of Exodus. What a story about Moses. And the text has already been read for us. I won't repeat it all, but some of it I will. And just to give a little update on where we are now is just to tell you a backdrop. Moses, for those of you who don't know, was a young man who was born at a time where it was not okay to be born. His life was waiting to be snuffed out. And his mother, in her love and in her faith, uh, put her son in a basket, believing that it would lead to his safety. And what do we see? We see that he is picked up by Pharaoh's daughter, eventually raised in Pharaoh's house. So this young man who should have seen death, let alone poverty, gets the excess of life. He actually gets to grow up with privilege. He gets to grow up knowing that he's safe. He gets to grow up in the big house. But during that time there, he noticed that there was something going on with his people where his people were treated differently, which is very interesting not to bypass because they recognized that although he grew up in Pharaoh's house, he knew he was distinctly different. And as he saw his people suffering, he then attempted to solve the problem in his own hands. And what did that lead to? It led to him committing murder. Uh, and this murder then didn't do what he thought it was going to do. He thought it would get their support and their praise, but they looked to him as if to say, oh, you're going to do it to us next? And he fleed for his life because, again, he found out he, once again, was not part of the house, as quiet as he thought he was, because when Pharaoh got the news, he sought to have Moses killed. Again, raised in this, this system, raised with these people, but yet and still, when Pharaoh found out that Moses... He killed an Egyptian. His life was now in a threat. And so now we find him, Moses on the run. And in the previous verses within this chapter, starting in chapter 3, we heard in verse 10 where God gives a command as he is called Moses. And this is what he says, Come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. That's the call. That's the command. And today what we'll see in this text is we see this great call and an inadequate vessel. This inadequate vessel has a great call and it shakes him. And what we see in this text in this 13, I mean 3 through 11 through 417 is this interaction between this broken vessel, this inadequate vessel, and the great mighty God. And in this conversation, Moses being the human being that he is, here's the great call but has some excuses as to why he's not the one for it. We see this interaction between God and Moses where we're able to peer into a conversation that I want us to recognize is not necessarily normal. In this time, it's very unique that the God of Israel, the God of all gods, the God who created heaven and earth, is speaking to Moses. It's not like he thought he heard something. He audibly heard the voice of God. He sees a burning bush. He goes towards it. Miraculous works of God. The bush is burning, but the, the bush is on fire, but it's not burning. It's not being destroyed. And in this moment, you would think that after seeing that, you would just say, okay, whatever you say, I'm doing it. <laughs> you would think that that would cause him to move, but that is not what happens. He comes up with a series of literally five excuses as to why he's not the man for the job. He opens up by saying, God, listen, who am I? Like, who am I that you would send me? Like, what, what makes you think that you can send me as a person to be a representative for you in this situation? Moses recognizes that he's going to Pharaoh. Pharaoh is the king, and Pharaoh is actually seen as a god by the Egyptians. Which is a legitimate fear, but God says go. But I want you to see what's very interesting about what Moses' first excuse is. This wonderful God who he's had an encounter with and he's shocked by already, 
has told him to go, and his first response is to look at himself. It's this inward look. He looks at himself and he sets himself as a standard. Think about it. How many times have we heard God say something and the first thing is that we look at ourselves, well, God, I can't because I. Who am I? And what is the wonderful God's response to him? God answers and says, I will be with you. That's it. He didn't tell him what he's going to do. He doesn't tell him how he's going to do it at this point. His answer to his inadequacy of who am I to go before Pharaoh is that I will be with you. Moses, hearing these words, does not stop there, and he continues with another excuse. Well, he says, well, then who are you? Now, you've got to realize, Joseph has been dead and gone. The people of Israel are slaves now. Their God is not the God that is worshipped nationally. All these foreign gods stand in Egypt. This is what they've been under for all these years. And Moses, who has been distant from Egypt as he's left because his life was in danger, is now saying, well, who, who are you? And God says these famous words, I am who I am. I promise you, those are some of the most powerful words known to humanity. It seems very simple, but I promise you, if you went up to somebody and said, who are you? And they said to you, I am that I am. You would say, what? What does that even mean? (laughs) But come to God, it's this idea of saying, no, I am He, I am the one, I am the self-existing God. I'm the creator and sustainer of all things. I am the immutable God, which means I'm never changing. I am always the same today, yesterday, and forevermore. He is the God who is eternal. He is only There's nothing before him, there's nothing after him. I am who I am, Yahweh. And this is a wonderful introduction because it speaks to the power of God. So as he speaks to Moses saying, listen, I know you're afraid. You're saying, who are you? And I'm telling you, don't worry because I will go with you before Pharaoh. And you're saying, well, who are you then, God, that I'm speaking to? I am the one that everyone thinks they're worshiping. I am the true God of all. Now the God he speaks of, says, I'm the God of your forefathers. He doesn't just stop there. He doesn't just stop with I am, but then he takes him down this path of history. He says, the Lord, the God of your forefathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is this idea of saying, listen, not only am I going to tell you I am who I am, I'm going to tell you the historical aspect so you know I know your people. I know your history. It speaks to the fact, who else could know this far back? Who could be able to speak to this but God who existed before all? And he speaks of how he'll be remembered throughout the generations. And God gives very clear directions of what Moses is to do. He instructs him, telling him to go. He says, listen, I have observed you What has been done to you in Egypt, speaking of the children of Israel, and I promise that I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Hevites, and the Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey, and they will listen to your voice, and you and the elders of Israel shall go to the king of Egypt and say to this, the Lord God of the Hebrews has met with us, and now please let us go a three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. Now I want to stop there because when you read that, you may just gloss over it. But I want you to think about what was said here. God says, I heard your cry, and I'm calling you out. 
But what is he calling them out for? He's not calling them out just to save them. He's calling them out not only to save them, but calling them to worship. He's calling them to worship. So often we think of our circumstances as God, save me, get me out of my circumstance, and that's just it. God is saying, I'm getting you out of your circumstance, but I want you to recognize you should have been worshiping me, but now even more you should worship me because of what I've done. That is good. Yeah. He doesn't know to Moses to tell to Pharaoh, to let his people out because God said it, and you better watch out before he kills you. No, he says, tell Pharaoh to let them go so they can come and worship me. Moses continues with his series of excuses. He goes on to say this. God, I hear what you're saying. You've told me that it's not about me. You'll be with me. You told me who you are. You're powerful and how this is going to go down. But now Moses said, but they won't believe me. They won't believe what I say. Why would they adhere to my voice when I speak on this issue. And what does God do? He says, listen, I'm going to give you three signs that will speak to the fact that I am the one who called you to do this. The three signs are seen here where God shows his control over the elements. He tells Moses, take your staff, your shepherd's staff in your hand, and he says, release it to the ground, and it turns into a snake. Now, you would think that in seeing this, Moses might have just kind of stood still, but it says, the text says he kind of jumped. He runs away from this. Now, he ran towards a bush that was burning, that was not being consumed, but he saw a snake and ran away from it. Now, I guess there's a certain level of common sense in that. Uh, you can run over your flame. You can kind of manage and see when it's getting out of control. A snake could snap and get you. So, uh, but, but he sees this and runs. And God's answer to him is this. Listen, no, 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 come back. Grab it by the tail. And he grabs it by the tail. And what happens? This snake is now a staff. Now, there will be those who will say, oh, no, this is, this is just figurative. No, this is literal right here. Now, what you'll say is if you look historically, you say, well, the Egyptians did such things. There, there are stories of how the magicians, which we see later on in the text where Pharaoh calls the magicians they, to do, do some magnificent works. The magicians do these things. But it's distinctly different. So what happened in those times is that magicians were actually able to hypnotize animals. Wow. And so using this trick of magic to hypnotize, there's historical records saying that it can make a snake literally extend and become as stiff as a board. So that they can then just pick it up like a rod. But God does something different. Again, he's not only showing Moses who he is, but he's doing things so that when he goes before Pharaoh and his magicians and the people of Israel and all of Egypt, he'll show them who he is. He says, I don't do idolatry. I take material things like a piece of wood and I turn it into a snake. And then I can change that and transform it back into a staff. And Moses hears this. And after hearing this, you would think that would be enough, but God says, let me give you another thing to do. I want you to take your hand and put it in your cloak. And then take your hand out. And what happened is when he took his hand out, it was leprous. Now, leprous was, leprosy was something that was a death sentence in those times. Uh, it was very, very much uh, a disease that could transfer easily. Someone could easily get infected by it, which is why they were often outcast and put in their own little land. It was a debilitating disease. And so, therefore, there's something you didn't want to do because it consumed your very being and deteriorated your body. And what God does in this moment, the I am that I am, he says, take your normal hand, put it in your pocket, pull it out, and now it's leprous. God is showing his control in the first sign of the elements. Now he's showing control of the very human body, the DNA, your blood vessels, every neurological nerve in your system he's in control of. It says, pull it out. And it says, put it back in. And what happens? His hand is back to normal. This is the I am speaking right now. And I know in our 21st century, 
Western culture, it is hard to imagine such things. But this is not a fictional story. This is historical record of what happened. Yes. And despite this, Jesus says, God says this, if that world does not work, if they still don't believe after seeing these two things, this is what I'm going to tell you to do. Tell them to listen for your voice. You shall take some water from the Nile and pour it on the dry ground. And the water that you shall take from the Nile will become blood on the ground. Moses, in this moment, is hearing from God of what we will soon later see where the Nile is turned into blood. And what you don't know is that historically, the Nile was almost a place of worship. There was this idea that water was life. It was something to be worshipped. And, and this was their thriving place. The Nile was a place of commerce. It was a place that provided things that they needed in order to flourish as a people. And God is saying, listen, this very source is life. I am going to then make it blood, which references death. Because life is in him, and he's speaking to this idea. What you are living now is a death sentence. Because you are not serving the true and living God. Now you hear this. Now I want us to think about what all has already transpired. God has spoken to Moses. Moses is given his excuse saying, who am I? And God answers to him as I will be with you. He says, well, then who are you? And he says, I am the I am. I am Yahweh. And he says, well, they won't, they won't believe me. And he says, I'm going to give you these three signs, not that I'm fictionally telling you about to look for it in the future. I'm actually doing it in the presence of you so that you now can speak with authority, knowing that if he said it, he meant it. And now you would think after that that Moses would be it. I'm on it, God. Let's go. You're with me. I've just seen you turn a staff into a snake, a snake back into a staff, and you turned my hand leprous and made it right again. Okay, let's go. But no, no, there's still yet another excuse. Moses says this. He says, but God, I, I, I can't talk. My speech isn't quite good enough. I, I, I don't know how to use fancy words to speak before the Pharaoh. I'm in eloquent. And the Lord simply answers him with this. He says, listen, I will be in your mouth. He speaks to the fact of that he's with him. Now, what you'll notice in the verses before that, he says, uh, who makes him, who has man made, who's made man's mouth? Who makes him mute, deaf, or seeing, or blind? Is it not the Lord? Now, therefore, go, I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall speak. God is, again, speaking to the fact that, listen, I am the author and creator of all things. I made your mouth. And in this moment, I'm saying right now, it does not matter that you're ineloquent. I will teach you. And I want us to see the beauty of the graciousness and patience of God. Moses at this point has given him four excuses as to why he cannot do what God told him to do. And God has graciously responded, answering all of his excuses with solid answers. And you would think even then that it would be good to go. Moses would finally speak up and say, all right, I'm ready to go. But he doesn't. And this is where the story shifts. Because beforehand... We can all relate to the idea. These are some legitimate questions. Mm -hmm. He has been estranged from God for years now, so he doesn't, he doesn't know. He doesn't have the intimate relationship that his forefathers had. Yes. So there is this adequate element of just like, listen, who am I to go do this? Pharaoh is like a god. He's not just a king. He's a god. He's worshipped. To stand before Pharaoh and speak against him is liable to get you killed. Not liable. It will get you killed. There is this element of like, who are you? Because I'm, I'm not familiar with you like I should to walk in this confidence. And, and God answers this. He then goes on, like we said, he said, but what in case they don't believe me? Because the people, I tried to help them before and they turned on me. So why would they believe me now? I've been gone, running for my life. I don't even have the connections where they would have even been able to reference me again. God graciously says, listen, I'll give you these signs. And he says, but I can't talk. I'm not eloquent in speech. I, I don't know how to do it. 
And God says, listen, I will teach you. I'll be your voice. And this again where the tide turns because he says, now, can you just send someone else? Can you send someone else? Now you say, well, what, what makes that distinctively different than anything else he has said up until this point? Well, the difference is, is this, is that because in that moment, when he says, can you send something, someone else, he is for the first time rejecting the directive that God has given. This is the actual moment where a sinner is in his heart. He's saying, I've heard all that you have said, send somebody else. This is where disobedience comes into play. It's okay to say, I don't think I can do this. It's okay to say, I feel inadequate. But you go to the scriptures and allow the power of God and the Holy Spirit to empower you to do the work. But when you say, send someone else, you're telling God he doesn't know what he's doing. You're telling God that somehow you're more sovereign than he is. You need to send somebody else because you obviously came into the wrong man. The bush burning, all the, the, all the, the tricks you've done, all these miraculous things. Listen, you obviously said that you, you picked wrong. Call somebody else. And you notice the difference in the text because it says, Then the, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. Now, as a parent or as a, someone who's ever been in charge of somebody, we all know that after the second excuse, we would have been fed up. <laughs> after the third excuse, we would have been trying to do something. Fourth excuse, we've lost our mind. But it's all the way into the fifth where Moses again says, I'm not doing it, send someone else, where God is angry. And why do I make that distinction? Because I want you to know that God is not angry with you when you ask questions. God is not angry with you when you struggle with the fact that he's called you to do something. There's certain elements of, yeah, it's natural to be fearful of that. God is angry is when, after he has heard your call, heard your cry and your concern, and he's answered it through your time in prayer and through his word, you don't have to go waiting for a word. He's giving you his word where he is speaking to you. But then you say, I'm not going to do it. You got to send somebody else. That is when God is like, no. I can handle, I can work with the other. When you reject my clear direction. Because you have actually put yourself in front of me. That is where we have a problem. But it doesn't stop there because what do we have? We have a wonderful, gracious God. And after this anger being kindled, he says to him, I'm going to give you someone. Go ahead and grab Aaron, your brother, the Levite. I know that he can speak well. Behold, he is coming out to meet you. And when you see him, he will be glad in his heart. You shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth, and I will be with your mouth and with his mouth, and I will teach you both what to do. God in his graciousness, despite having the anger because of the specific rejection, the disobedience, the rejecting of what his call was, says, listen, I'm even going to give you what you want. This is not an unfamiliar story, though. I just want to create a little parallel. Think about Israel. God said, I'll be with you. What did they say? We need a king like everybody else. In that moment, like Moses, he didn't realize the beauty of what he had. He had the living God saying, I will be in your mouth with you. I will give you the words and I will teach you. I will guide you. You don't have to have anybody else serving as a mediator. I will speak directly with you. But he, Moses says, well, I, I need somebody else. Mm, Jesus. Israel said, we've got the king who's brought us out. We have the history of Moses and our forefathers and how we got brought out of Egypt. And, and, and we know you said you'll walk with us and provide for us. But we still need a king like the other nations that you said are bowing at your knee and no comparison to you. 
That's what they wanted. And God gave them that. And what did they get in Saul? They got an inadequate leader. What did they get in Aaron? An inadequate leader. Remember Aaron? While Moses is up there, what does he do? He bows to the people, creates a graven image so they can worship. After they got out of Egypt, God is faithful even in the midst of our requests of things that are so much less qualified than he is. And God to Aaron is, uh, to Moses saying, listen, I'm going to meet you where you're at. I'll be with you and I'll be with Aaron. And you all will go before Pharaoh. Now, you've got to bear with me. I hope my memory serves me right. I believe it's in Acts chapter 7. I want us to hear this part where it speaks of Moses. This is where Stephen is speaking right before, I believe, he is stoned. And I'm sorry, this just popped into my mind. Hopefully I can find it. And it speaks of Moses, and he references him. And I can't find it. Ah! Okay, there's a part here in Acts chapter 7 where it makes a reference to Moses. And Stephen says of how Moses was actually quite eloquent in speech. <laughs> Verse 22, thank you very much. That's what I was talking about, crowd participation. And Moses was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptian, and he was mighty in his words and deeds. This man was actually running from himself. He actually had, to a certain element in his natural, what he needed in order to be a voice. And it still he uses an excuse. But God, despite this flaw and all of this, still works through him and uses him to go forward. And what's interesting is this relationship that now exists between him and Aaron because it says, now you, Moses, will be as me to Aaron as I am to you. And Moses now serves as a mediator. God will speak to Moses. Moses will speak to Aaron. Aaron will speak to the Pharaoh. He's the mediator. And what do we get to say about that, which is such a beautiful thing? We learn of a mediator. A great mediator who stands before us, before the Father, interceding on our behalf to reconcile us. But the beautiful thing is, in his mediation, he's different than what we see here because he has, is God. So look, at, look, look, look what's happened now. There's no longer a distinguishedness of like, oh no, we've got to go through somebody to get to God. God is saying, no, I presented myself to you so you can interact with me directly. There is no other mediator that you need. You are talking to me now. Yes. And that's the beauty of what we have through Christ and salvation. That is the beauty of what we have when we see this great work for it says there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men. And the man Christ Jesus who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. He is our great mediator. That's 1 Timothy Chapter 2, verses 5 through 6. So in this text, we see Moses giving excuses. We hear the call of God. And ultimately, because many of us have read this, we know how this story plays out. Moses is obedient. He does what the Lord says. God does his miraculous works. But we have to ask ourselves, when looking at a text like this, what does that mean for me in 2021? Yes, there's some great principles that we've seen here and heard, but Ashanti, what does this do for me now? What do I do with this now? And learning our application. Well, I believe when we look at this, there are always two things to ask ourselves. What do we learn about ourselves, and what do we learn about God from the text? What is it that we see from those who are in the text that teaches us about ourselves, and what do we learn about our great God? Well, the first thing we learn in regards to ourselves is this. We cannot let our inadequacies lead us to disobedience. At any point. At any point. That's good. 
God has called you. He's giving you directives as to what to do. I understand. It seems crazy at times. I understand it may be uncomfortable at times. I understand that you may be legitimately concerned because you are inadequate. But despite all those feelings, just as God spoke to Moses, he is speaking to you now saying, listen, I am with you, so you go do it. Take your gaze off of yourself and put your gaze on him. And when you do that, the things that seem impossible actually seem so possible because, you know, it's not on me to do. If he's called me to do it, then it's going to get done. See, the difference is, is when we try and come up with something, I'm going to go do this. You might fail. <laughs> it is a 50-50 chance. You could succeed or you could fail. When God says, no, this is my will, go do this, whatever he has planned to accomplish through that is going to happen. No questions asked about it. Like Moses, you can go before God with your concerns saying, I feel uncomfortable, but you submit them to the will of God and say, not my will, but your will be done, God. Help me, empower me, strengthen me to do it. There are all kinds of reasons to say why you can't, but I want you to hear the final words spoken in the scriptures of the New Testament in regards to the very character featured in this narrative. This is what it says in Hebrews 11. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that the child was beautiful and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeing pleasure of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By faith, he left Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith, he kept the Passover and sprinkled the blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch them. This is the final story we see. By faith, the people crossed the Red Sea on dry land, but the Egyptians, when they attempted to do the same, were drowned. This is Moses. Look at how God has moved and transformed this young man who was inadequate, who gave all these excuses, who even sinned, but yet and still God speaks of him as a man of faith. So I'm telling you that right now. So as you think about your history, as you think about how you dropped the ball, as you even think about your disobedience, I call you and tell you right now, saying God is saying, listen, that is not the end of the story. Repent. God's not thinking about what you did in the past. Let it go. And walk in obedience, knowing that your story is not yet over. What do we learn about ourselves? But again, ultimately, what do we learn about God? I will say first and foremost is this, is that God is patient. <laughs> God is so patient. And on, on this day, as we celebrate moms, as we celebrate uh, on a, a few months Father's Day, and we think about the ways that even our friends and family members aren't always the most patient with us, I want you to know that all your earthly experiences pale in comparison to who God is. So don't hold him to their standard. Hold him to his standard, which is in his word. And God is a patient God. We see it from the beginning all the way to the end. He could have easily thrown his wrath out, but God patiently walks with his people. And he's patiently walking with you and me. You may feel good and say, well, you know what? Hey, man, I've been pretty faithful. I've been walking with God consistently. You don't even realize how much patience he's had with you. God is patient. And the last thing we learn about God is this. And just so you guys know, I'm preaching to myself in this sermon. <laughs> this, is, this is hitting home for me, too. Is this. Not only is he patient, 
But his call, like the call of God, is about him. And he will always do what he needs to do through his obedient vessel. The call is about him. And the work of doing the call can be done through his obedient vessel. And so God is saying, listen, it's me who does the work through you. I can't talk. I'll talk for you. Who am I? I'll be with you. He's saying, listen, I'm calling you to do something that I'm not telling you to do in your own strength. You can't do it without me. I'm not calling you to be independent. I'm calling you to be dependent on me holistically because it is I who does the work through you. And so therefore, if I have called you, then I will complete what I have called you to. You are facing challenges in your life. God has called you to do something that seems abnormal. It seems out of the pocket. And you're saying, God, how can I do this? And God is saying, I didn't tell you you know, he need to know how. I just need you to go. How you would do it is in my strength and in my power. Resting in me, being obedient until the end. And this applies to us all, even in a very simplistic way. You say, well, I don't have anything that God has called me to right now of a, of a big dream. I've got news for you. God has called you to do to something that is probably one of the hardest things to do. Are you ready, church, to hear what that is? That's where you actually respond. <laughs> He's called you to be an obedient, faithful child of God. He's called you to look like him. He's called you saying, I want you to be my representative. I want you to represent me to the world. In deed, in how you live, in speech, in how you care for others. And think about the word that comes from Paul in Philippians 1, 6, as he's speaking to the believers who are suffering persecution and who are financially strapped on going through hardships. He says this in his opening. Just six, on the six verses he comes in, he says this, and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. And when he's speaking of the day of Jesus Christ, he's talking about when Christ returns. So it's this idea of saying, listen, the one who calls you will complete what he's done in you. Just keep going, saints. Just keep walking with them, saints. Just keep repenting and then walking in faith more. Just keep reading his word and allowing it to be in your heart so that it transform you. And then you will look like him more. But even when you fall, know that, listen, he's completing it. He's bringing it to the end. This is even spoken of in Thessalonians where he calls them and he says, listen, he who called you is faithful. He will surely do it. It's this idea he will bring you through the entire sanctification process until it's time to come home for him. He is going to do it. You're worried about You're worried about You can't. I can. And as you rest in the I can of the I am, you're good to go. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Mm. There's so much in our lives where we have negative thoughts, where we say to you or to ourselves what we can and cannot do. We can't beat this to addiction. We can't go this place that you've told us to go to. We can't step into this element of faith. We can't share this gospel. We can't forgive them. We can't let go of that unhealthy relationship. We can't. We can't all this. I'm not good enough. There's no way you would use me. And Lord, I pray that you would just begin to break the strongholds that have captivated our minds and our hearts. Loosen the shackles so we can actually walk in the freedom that actually exists because we are yours. You did not save us to then have us live shackled. But you saved us and set us free and say, walk in the freedom that you now have. Help us to walk by faith. Help us to be obedient when it's uncomfortable. 
and help us to always recalibrate our thinking, saying, you know what, God, I think this is on me, but I recognize that it's not on me. It's on you because you have called me. And so, Lord God, as I rest in you, I know that you will get me through this. Lord, may this reign true in the hearts of all that are here. I pray for those who are listening now, who, whether through the TV or YouTube or, or in this presence of this church, those who you have called to faith right now, that they not say, well, you couldn't be talking to me, but they will respond in obedience so they can walk in the new life that is found only in you, Christ Jesus. There are a ton of earthly gods, but there is only one I am. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.